Many of us have experienced failure and disappointment in our lives. I know, <laughs> I certainly have. And in this game of internet marketing, blogging, trying to earn a living from your internet business, many of us have experienced some form of failure or just um, sort of a slow period where we had to learn something that we didn't already know to be able to overcome and move to the next level. So today I wanna to talk about some blogs that have experienced that. Some of these are sites where they just haven't ever hit their stride. They never hit that hockey stick growth and the owners are just frustrated trying to figure out what's wrong. In other cases, the sites had some initial success and then got hit by something and that's caused them to take a path in the wrong direction. We asked you to share some sites with us that have experienced that as we've seen this ourselves in many of our own sites as well as with working with just hundreds and even thousands of other site owners. We've learned to identify a handful of causes. And um, anyway, today I wanna to be able to walk you through that process of what we look at, um, how we figure out maybe what's causing some of these issues, and then how we could go about fixing that. So we went to you and we asked you for some examples of sites that you feel like have been failures. Now we got a lot of responses and um, to some of you, we reached back out and asked for some follow-up information. And even to you who sent us additional information, there are some of you who were just not gonna have time to cover your, uh, your websites in this video. And honestly, I'm gonna have to move pretty quickly. I'm a little long-winded sometimes, sorry. I wanna dive right in now. We're gonna cover as much as we can. And even if we don't get to your website that you submitted, there's going to be some learnings here that will probably be something that you can apply to your site probably some of the causes for why you failed as well. So these are the top causes and here's how we find them. To get started today, I wanna to look at GoTreeQuotes.com. This is a pretty cool website here on the homepage. Um, there's a tool where I can search my zip code and I can look for tree removal services. Um, kind of a neat lead generation tool here. Um, I can look into different services available and find out what they cost. Um, here's kind of some neat articles here about you know, how much tree removal costs, how much tree trimming costs, um, average price, that's awesome. I love that you're giving me that information right up front. So what happened? This is a site that started to see that hockey stick growth. And in fact, um, we have some Google Analytics here from, from the owner of this website. So earlier this year, this site finally hit that hockey stick growth. We look in March, April, May, and then May 4th happens and boom, gets slammed. So there's issue number one. There was a major core algorithm update that went out on May 4th and it just hammered a lot of sites, particularly blogs owned by individuals, um, people without strong EAT, without a strong um, organization backing them. Now, not all sites um, in that case were hit. A lot of the big sites seem to come out okay, even come out on top, but a lot of us individuals, maybe not so much. There are some other things though that I think um, made this site particularly vulnerable to that. We'll get to that in a second. And then the other issue here is this kind of steady followed by downward sloping traffic um, since that time in May. Okay, so two things going on here. The first one um, we can see right here on the analytics, probably the primary vulnerability. And that is, and this is not uncommon by the way, especially on newer sites, but this is a site with almost 200 blog posts, but these top 10 articles, these top 10 pages, none of which is even the homepage, these top 10 articles drive over 50% of the traffic for the entire website. That's not just like 50% of entrances to the site, 50% of all page views occur on 10 pages of this website. All it takes is for one of those to get knocked off, which is not what seems to have happened here. In fact, this is how we would look at that. I can look at one of these, let's look at the top one, and I can see that this article, oh, I need to look at unique page views. They looks like they had a little bit of a, um, a little bit of a analytics reporting issue there that led to that duplication of page views, which also might be part of why May looked so amazing. Um, but even if we just look at the unique page views, we see that this number one article, it's certainly, and in fact, that drop-off seems maybe even a little more pronounced than the site-wide average. So that's concerning to me. 
if we look at this, you know, weekly or monthly, then we can actually start to do some analysis and say, you know what, here in the June, July, August, July, August timeframe, I was getting 2,400 page views. Ooh, now I'm down to 800. That's more than the rest of the site. Um, and that one article getting 15% of the traffic to the website, that kind of a hit, that's a big deal. Now, if I go back to the overview and I click on the second one, and again, now I gotta go back to unique page views. Normally I can just look at page views, but again, we got that double reporting issue here. Um, I do see that drop off again, and it looks most pronounced in November, but it kind of fits the site-wide average. There's not as much of a drop off in, at the May algorithm update timeframe, but there's still a bit of a drop off. As I look through the top articles on the website, I might go through even 10 or 20 and identify, was it one or two articles that are driving the majority of the decline or in the May timeframe, the majority of that huge drop off? Or is it site-wide? In this case, it looks like that first article may have driven a reasonable portion of that drop off in May. When you have a lot of your traffic coming to just a handful of pages, you're particularly vulnerable. Not necessarily just because one of those articles will get outranked for sort of the primary search term, but also because if an article is doing really, really well, there's a chance that it's ranking not just for your, the primary search term that you wrote it for, but for numerous um, tangential search terms. And so even if you do some checking here and there, you know, you go to a, a browser you never log into Google on and you just do that search and you see, no, what's the deal? I'm still ranking number one. Well, you might be ranking number one for the primary search topic you wrote the article for, but you may have been knocked off of several of those tangential search phrases. This happens a lot when they do these core algorithm updates, especially as Google continues to try to get better and better and better at understanding the semantics behind the search. That's what Google's trying to do. They're trying to get to the core of what people are actually looking for and then trying to provide them with the best answer that's most likely to be accurate. And so where it used to be really easy to win not just one search term but a bunch, it's getting harder and harder to do. And so if you have a site with a handful of articles driving a ton of your traffic, there's a very high probability that when there's a big algorithm update, you're gonna get hammered. Now the other issue, I'm going really long just on this first one. This is why I can't get to all of your websites. I'm really sorry. I'm gonna do my best though, and even if this video goes a little bit long, I'm gonna keep going. All right, the other issue is seasonality. The owner of this website said, look, I know that there's seasonality behind my niche, but the seasonality that Google Trends doesn't suggest that I should lose this much traffic. Well, I don't know what you searched in Google Trends, and that's the nuance behind Google Trends. If you look up tree service, yeah, that might not be as seasonal, but the primary topic of your website is the cost of tree removal services or the cost of tree services. And when I look up tree removal cost, I see over 50% of the searches drop off in the off season. So you've got a great season up here with numbers averaging about 65 um, right here throughout the summer, this year even higher. Um, so that might have been, again, again, a big driver in May behind why you had such high traffic. But, you know, level that off and then it drops 50% by the time November hits. So seasonality could be a much bigger driver behind that slow taper drop than you think it is. And if that's the case, keep working on content and next spring, you're probably going to see a lot of that traffic return. Now, you have 197-ish blog posts, I believe. What it's time to do with any of those blog posts over about a year old is to go back and do the battleship method on those. We have a great YouTube video all about the battleship method. If you're in Project 24, there's a tool that's gonna help walk you through that. Go battleship those articles. Let's identify the ones that aren't succeeding yet and let's go make them win so we can spread that traffic out across a lot more than 10 or 20 blog posts. Let's utilize all 200 blog posts on your website. All right, I really wanted to address this next one. This website is bestoutdooritems.com. This is a website that has seen success in the past um, and it's declined uh, in recent times. The reason I believe that this type of website is declining and it's not just this site, but it's many sites of this kind is they're no longer serving the purpose that they once had. As we look through this website, you'll see that I mean, at least here on the homepage, it appears that this entire website 
is product descriptions. They're called reviews, but as we click on one and we look through it, I see that there is, in fact, let's just look at the contents. Uh, oh, this one is more of a review. Top sets reviewed, find the right croquet set for you. Um, as I get here, there's a nice, there's this table, okay? But this is all, this is all data from Amazon. Okay, here's the first one. Some pros and cons. Man, there's less info here than on Amazon for this product. Um, I don't see anything here that would give me any indication that you've actually ever used any of these products. And so therefore, how do you actually know which ones are better? And if that's the case, then wouldn't a review on Amazon by someone that actually bought the product be more beneficial to me? Now, some of these articles like, you know, best croquet sets, um, I would even go so far as to do like, hey, best croquet sets for, um, for kids under 12, right? Best croquet sets for college parties. Um, you know, let's get a little bit more specific here. And um, those best X for Y type posts can actually do pretty well when they're mixed in on a site with content other than just product review content. We are moving into a day when the blogger who can just take information from Amazon reviews and kind of curate that into a blog post and succeed, are, those are going away. If somebody's looking up best croquet set, you know what Google's thinking? This is somebody who wants to buy a croquet set. And so the top listed articles are actually gonna be product listings. And oftentimes Amazon is even like curating that list. They're recommending the top products based on thousands and thousands of purchases. They're even having blog posts written on Amazon comparing products. This is not an approach that's gonna to continue to work as we move into 2021 and beyond. It's not an approach that's been working that well the last couple of years anyway. And I think that's the primary driver behind why this site has been declining. It's just not gonna work. It seems like uh, this is someone who really does love the outdoors, loves doing things in the outdoors. Best items outdoor, to me that it's pretty clearly a product driven website. But man, let's try to, let's try to create some content um, just about being in the outdoors and about using products in the outdoors and using those products to be able to have a better experience in the outdoors. Focus a little bit less on trying to make the sale and just putting products in front of people and hoping they, they click on a few and let's try to create content that is not necessarily directly intended to make you money, but is intended to help somebody. You'll actually make a lot more money that way. All right, this next one is all about scuba diving and places to go scuba diving. Now, um, I can see where the creator of this website, where they feel really confident with what they've created because they have created some really cool content. Um, you know, when I come here to the website, it's like, hey, what kinds of things do I want to explore? It's like, um, cenotes, cool. Um, so that leads me to a specific article with links to a whole bunch of specific destinations. Okay, that's pretty cool. There's like no other content here other than a list. So how is anybody gonna find this article? How's Google gonna know what it should rank for? You only have like a tiny bit of information here. So here, you know, I'm standing in Tulum. I started to wonder myself, where are the best cenotes in Mexico? There's only one way to find out, visit them all. Here's where all of them are. Um, there's actually, you know, again, I'm not trying to be mean or hypercritical, but there's actually another way to find out where the best cenotes for diving are. That's to ask someone who has been through them um, where they recommend. I certainly couldn't go dive all of the cenotes in Mexico. Um, and so here you've got, okay, here are the 10 most popular, but you know what? The 10 most popular cenotes in Mexico, there are probably like 30 articles that all list the same 10. That's part of why they're the most popular. What if instead you wrote an article that was, you know, 10, um, 10 beautiful cenotes in Mexico that most tourists don't even know about? That would be pretty cool. This is a place where what we need to find is more unique information. Now that can be hard to do if you're not someone that's totally out there living your niche every single day, but with a little bit of deeper digging, maybe even starting to survey your audience or even going to um, existing groups on Reddit and Facebook and just finding out, hey, what are some of your favorite places to dive? Um, maybe do some polls and say, hey guys, you know what, I'm writing an article and you know I've been to some really cool places, but um, I obviously haven't been everywhere. 
Where have you guys been that's super awesome? Um, and do some polls and just get some user generated information and try to curate some more unique lists and provide that sort of insider information that doesn't already exist. Because if I put together a list of the best cenotes and I have the same top 10 as everybody else, my article does not have any unique value. And without unique value, Google has no reason to promote your content above anybody else. Another issue I keep coming across on this website is, um, and really it kind of harkens back to the same issue we had before, is you know I look at destinations and stuff, and I click on one of these destinations um, totally randomly here. Um, I'm, what I'm struggling here is to figure out what is the search term that this article is meant to rank for. If the search term is, you know, scuba diving Tioman Island, well, how many people are probably searching that? It's probably pretty low, right? What we need to do is try to get to the base of the inverted pyramid. The base of the inverted pyramid is where most of the people are searching. It tends to be the more beginner content, the entry content. You're gonna have large volumes of people looking for, but that most people aren't going to write. You, you get people writing about scuba diving and they're focused on the stuff that all the divers, like the actual hardcore divers need to know, right? Um, you know, really specific tips and gear for cave diving and stuff. But man, that stuff that is base of the pyramid, there's a small number of people searching it and it's really specialized. You can find great long tail keywords, the ones that other people aren't writing about, way up here at the base of the pyramid where there are a lot of people who could search that topic. Scuba diving locations, that is kind of base of the pyramid, but also what about all the, uh, the other stuff around you know, how to get scuba certified? Um, and just about you know, tips for getting your gear different places or, or for finding places to rent gear. Um, you know, what if you focused on sort of the off the beaten path kind of dive places and you put some of those in there and you wrote content again that was geared toward a specific search term that somebody's likely to search for. So not how to dive in this remote place in Mexico nobody's ever heard of, but rather, hey, 10 generally unknown um, awesome cenote dives in the Yucatan Peninsula, right? Like if I'm a hardcore diver, that's where I'm going. Or even if I'm just someone looking for something unique, that's where I'm going. Now that may feel like that doesn't jive with the whole um, base of the pyramid thing I was just talking about, but think about it. There are a lot of people searching for scuba dive destinations. And so it is base of the pyramid. It's just more long tail on the base of the pyramid. It's a, it's a subset of that base, but there are substantial people looking for destinations for where to scuba dive. It's just that if you create the same list as everybody else, you're just gonna get lost in the noise. One of the biggest issues we find that prevents a site from ever really taking off from an SEO perspective, from you know, organic Google traffic, is the search analysis, is coming up with the right topics. Here I actually have several websites where they've done a lot of things pretty well, but they're, the search analysis is not quite there. And let me show you why. So this one is uh, Fishing Again, um, pretty good website, he's written some pretty good stuff here for sure. Um, the benefits of pre-baiting and the reason your catch rate is pathetic. Who, who, am I Googling why is my catch rate pathetic? Um, I might be Googling like, how come I don't catch fish? Um, and certainly Google is not dis deciding which articles rank based just on the headline, right? It's, it's based on the content. And so if your article is explaining, it's, it's about catch rate, it's about I don't catch very often, that kind of stuff. Google's gonna know that that's what your, what your content is about. When I say, how come I don't ever seem to catch fish? And this article pops up, I'm like, what's pre-baiting? That's not what I searched for. That's not necessarily the terminology that I'm using, or if I'm bad at fishing, that I necessarily even know. You know, 10 reasons you haven't caught in a while and how to fix it, that's maybe a little bit more on point there. Some of these I think are, are better for sure. Float fishing for carp, beginners, a dying art. Again, if I'm a beginner, I probably don't know to search for this. Does that make sense? So we need to just take a sort of different approach. We need to look at this from the perspective of the beginner and try to identify what are the things they're actually gonna search for, right? You know, beginner carp fishing ideas and 
techniques and stuff. You know, maybe if you focus on that path and write your articles from that perspective, it'll make it easier for Google to identify who that target audience is and be able to match it up with the right searches. And then if you write a headline that's geared that direction, people will know what to click on. Headlines are really important, not because of what they do for Google, but because of what they do for people. And as your article gets clicked on more because it's got a good headline, Google knows that it's the article people want to read and it will be promoted. We have this online genealogy site. Again, you know, these are people who um, are known in their field. And so they have that EAT, they should be able to get a lot of traffic to their blog. And now this website has um, undergone a bit of history, right? Started out on Blogger, moved to WordPress, lost a bunch of traffic, um, went from WordPress to Wix because Word Wix is easier to use. Um, the website looks great. I wouldn't keep fiddling with it. You know, pick, pick your platform, that's fine. But I think what we need to do is we need to get back to that search analysis and even the, the headline writing and, and try to write these for, again, the people that are searching it. Writing family histories, what books should you create? You know, are people searching like, what books do I need to create for my family history? Publishing your genealogy, that could be something people would be Googling about. This is more of a complete guide. Genealogy research in US tax records, a basic overview of this awesome records. Um, again, great tutorial here, but a lot of this feels like staple content. Staple content is kind of that interest-based content. Um, it's that tutorial type content that we put on our blogs that is really information that people need. The problem with staple-based content is oftentimes it's hard to rank for. And if you can rank for it, it is something that oftentimes people aren't directly searching. That's really a big issue here, is you've, you've got content here that is almost like it's written for a social media platform. It's written for a platform where that information is put in front of users as opposed to them going and looking for it. We need to turn this around a little bit and try to identify what are the topics that people are looking for so that we can write some of those. You can use those articles once they start to rank well and bring in traffic, you can use those to point people to your staple content. And over time, that staple content will start to rank for tangential searches as well. But even with that staple content, we need to try to think, what is at least one primary question that people are actually likely to be Googling that this article can definitely answer? And once they're there, it will let them know that they need the rest of this complete guide. You know, what is the search for um, US tax records, right? Um, in genealogy, what's the search? What's somebody looking for? Um, you know, maybe it's an article about seven non-obvious places uh, where you can find loads of genealogy data. That one feels a little bit also social media-like. Maybe that's something fantastic for Pinterest. That feels like a fantastic YouTube video headline as well. Like seven non-obvious places where you find fantastic genealogy records. Now you guys do have a YouTube channel and so I would be using that YouTube content as much as possible to drive people to these tutorial type articles, these staple type pieces of content. As you do that, you will get people to those guides and you'll be able to really drive the traffic and build up authority on that website. You should be able to build that authority because you are authoritative in this space. So I think just keep at that. Utilize YouTube and especially with this tutorial content, you gotta get stuff that people are likely to find that points to that. Here's another one. This one is buyselfbalancingscooter.com. Clearly product focused. We already talked about the issues with that. The other issue here is, here's the article, the Razer MX350 Dirt Rocket. What's the Google search that's leading people to that? Is it review of the Razer MX350 Dirt Rocket? Now that's pretty specific and if that's what I want, I can find that on Amazon from people that actually own it. Now if you own this, which I'm not entirely convinced you do, some of the photos make it look like maybe you do, um, but if those are like product photos from Amazon or from somewhere else, um, that will become apparent. But the other and bigger issue here is you're creating a lot of content like motorized scooter. It's not a headline that's gonna do anything for you if it does show up in a Google search. And what is the search? Like what are you trying to win here? Are you trying to win motorized scooter? because that is gonna be a very, very broad topic that Google's not gonna know exactly what people want and is most likely to send them to shopping pages, not to a blog. 
This last one is a site, um, it's about pest removal, and this one is more just answering a question. So the main question that the owner of this website has is, is my drop in traffic seasonality related or is it, um, or is it something wrong with my website? Now, um, Google Trends is kind of an interesting tool here because it's looking at like really specific searches and keywords. It's not super general, right? It's not really semantically looking at everything. Um, and so pretty specific stuff, like specific articles, it can be hard because there's just not enough data for there to be much of a trend. So you do have to stay kind of high level. When I search just pest removal, what I see is a season that picks up about here in May and seems to run solidly through August, maybe even through September. Well, when I looked at the analytics for this website, it started dropping off like at the beginning of June. And so what that tells me is that either something is hurting this website, it's getting beaten by another site, or more likely it's just um, Google tested out the content, it didn't it just didn't do great, and so the, it landed, instead of ranking number one or two, it, some of the articles landed at number three or four. That happens. A lot of times we'll see um, traffic on, the, on a site or across articles kind of come up and then sort of dip back down and then sort of level off. And so it may be that that's what happened, and then that now seasonality is taking over and we're seeing an even further dip. Um, there's a lot, really a lot of data buried in those analytics. So um, that's something that we can't tell without really spending a lot of time diving into it. The other thing that may be happening is that um, there's a lot of content here on some aspect of, pet, of pest control that is really popular in the spring, but not as popular in other parts of the year. And if that's the case, it's time to really diversify the content a bit and try to create content that's gonna help to minimize the effects of seasonality. In the end, for Really, all of these sites, all of these topics, and all of these issues, what a lot of it comes down to is creating content that is designed for a specific search. Trying to win the number one result for some specific thing that people are likely to search. And ideally, something that's kind of at the base of that pyramid, where there's a lot of people more likely to be searching for that as opposed to things at the tip of the pyramid that are really only for those who are deeply entrenched within the niche. If you do that, you're gonna overcome a lot of these obstacles. The next one is to revisit your content, battleship that content. As your, as your site gets to be at least a year old, start to look back at that content that's aged at least one year and go through that battleship method process to really assess it, see where we landed, and decide what to do. It doesn't do any good to have 700 blog posts on a site, and yes, some of the submitted sites had that kind of content on it. It doesn't do you any good to have 700 blog posts if almost all of the traffic is coming to five or 10. So we really need to go through the content and identify what can be sort of cut out of here, what could be consolidated, what should just be ignored, and what should we try to win because hey, we're ranking number seven and it's bringing in 300 page views a month. So if we could rank number two, we could bring in thousands of page views with this one article. So that's what you need to be doing. And then we do need to look at Google updates and things, but for the most part, if your traffic is spread across enough articles on your website, chances are that no one update is going to cause the sort of substantial drop that we've seen with some of these sites.